in the previous video lecture, we saw two things. First of all, Sanskrit Kavya did not generally veer away from this generally accepted notion of Aujitya in society. In other words, the notion of Aujitya was not remaining isolated from the realm of Kavya as a theoretical concept. It was followed closely by literary theoreticians. Then, we inquired how creative writers were conditioned to follow the notion of Aujitya in Kavya. Here, we saw that it was made possible through Kavya Shiksha. That is, an aspiring poet was supposed to learn Kavya Shastra before composing poems. And an important part of the syllabus of Kavya Shiksha was always Aujitya. We also saw that Sanskrit literary theoreticians also considered Kavya as a way to instruct the readers, although entertainment was their primary concern. Now, how did Kavya perform this didactic function? Was it instructing the readers uh, explicitly? What we specifically need to note here is that the didactic function that Kavya performed was entirely different from that of the Vedas and Shastras. Abhinava Gupta's observation is a case in point here. Abhinava, in his Lojana on Anandavarthana's Thanyalaga, opines that while poetry instructs like a wife, Veda instructs like a master. Mamada reproduces the same quotation in Kavya Prakasha while talking about the way in which Kavya instructs its readers. The crux of Abhinava Gupta's uh, dictum is that while Shastra and the Vedas explicitly give moral instruction to readers, Kavya performed its deontic function rather implicitly by creating in readers an aspiration to act like the law-abiding noble characters. While the victory of the propriety-bound noble characters inspired the readers to conform to Aujitya, the fall of the intercourse Athama characters made the readers repulsive towards them. Phoja makes this point clearer in his Shringar Prakasha. He explains at length about the way in which readers need to read Kavya and self-fashion themselves after the characters who abide by the rules of decorum prevalent in the society. Phoja says, Literary texts are supposed to provide moral instruction. In the Ramayana and other literary works, others instruct us to act like Rama and not like Ravana by showing us the eventual victory of the righteous man and the fall of the morally degenerate one. Since Rama paid heed to his father's counsel, he emerged victorious, although he was exiled to the forest. But Ravana, who was capable of conquering the three worlds, perished miserably because he desired for another person's wife. This is a message regarding prohibition and precept. All the literary works such as Mahakavya and Prabandha are composed in a similar fashion. Pauja's conviction about the uses of stories is in line with Plato's concept of poetry as a sugar-coated pill that the readers should necessarily fashion themselves after the image of the noble characters portrayed in Kavya. While Shastra, Itihasa and the Vedas explicitly inform the readers as to how to behave, Kavya coaxes its readers into modeling their subjectivity after the noble characters who conform to the mores and values of the society. Poja is not the sole author to talk about this process of self-fashioning. He is in fact merely reproducing and explicating the ideas of his predecessors. One of the first literary theoreticians to comment upon this reader-oriented didactic function of Kavya was Kundaga. In Vakrakti Jivida, Kundaga talks about the importance of readers self-fashioning themselves after the noble heroes in Kavya always follow dharma vidhi or the moral action prescribed by the society. In the Ramayana based dramas of great poets which shine forth with all the five figurative deviations, what we have on the surface is the description of the noble heroes. But in reality, it ends up in a moral injunction. Act like Rama, not like Ravana. Similarly, in Tabasavatsaraja, the surface meaning denotes the history of the flower-hearted hero who is immersed in lovely games. But in reality, it advises that it is incumbent upon a minister to save his king who is drowning in the sea of sorrow. In his uh, Sahitya Darpana, Vishwanatha makes a similar observation. 
According to Vishwanatha, a reader who is desirous of achieving the four ends of human life should always model himself or herself upon the ideal characters of Kavya. To attain the four ends of human life from Kavya, one should act like Rama and not like Ravana, he says. In Kavya Prakasha, Mamada also subscribes to the view that art is for life's sake. Mamada observes, such poetry is the work of poets, clever in depicting things in a manner passing the comprehension of ordinary men. It offers to other poets and cultured men counsel most persuasively like a beloved wife by means of a moving tenderness in the manner of it. That is, in the words, counsel such as that one should behave like Rama and not like Ravana. As such, poetry is by all means to be studied and cultivated. This shows that art was to teach people how they should live their lives righteously in society. From these passages, dealing with the deontic function of Kavya, it could be drawn that Kavya Shastra, especially the concept of Aujitya, conceptualized Kavya as a suggestive force upon the readers. This function of suggestive force that Sanskrit the literary science ascribes to Kavya is something that it has directly borrowed from the uh, Purva Mimamsa tradition. Uh, the Purva Mimamsa hermeneutics holds that all Vedic passages are supposed to impart a moral injunction to its listener. Normally, only prohibitive and injunctive utterances have the power to propose a command and all other forms of sentences are usually statements of facts. But the view of the Mimamsakas is that even those passages which are neither injunctive nor prohibitive have the capacity to terminate a command or injunction. They call these sentences which perform the prohibitive or injunctive function at a subliminal level Arthavada passages. In his commentary on Bharata's Nati Shastra, Abhinavagupta exemplifies the Arthavada theory of the Purva Vimasa scholars. Abhinava opines, while a person listens to sentences from the scripture such as these. They conducted a rite of 21 night or he preferred the oblation into the fire. A qualified person who has the desire for the sacrificial fruit and other requirements will at first have the literal comprehension of the sentence which will be followed by a strong inclination towards the action described. After this, an excessive cognition dawns upon him with the result that the original time mentioned in the scripture is set aside and then he thinks, may I also hold a sacrificial session or may I also offer the oblation. Cognition of this ilk is termed differently by different philosophical schools such as Pradibha or intellection, Bhavana or effucation, Vithi, injunction, Udyoga and so on. By describing the merit of an action, the above Arthavada sentence persuades the listener to perform a similar action. Poja's comment in Shringara Pragasa on the deontic function of Kavya clearly shows that Kavya Shastra borrowed the idea of symbolic power, a soft power, from Arthavada of the Mimamsa philosophers. Poja says, every sentence has a communicative function. Even if it is not explicitly optative, every sentence aims towards a command or prohibition. For instance, in the sentence, arms are given here, what we should comprehend is a command, stay here. If it is not said that there are thieves on the way, it should be comprehended that one should not tread that path. In this sentence, there are sharks in the water, we must understand, do not swim here. A larger meaning like the Ramayana also functions in a similar manner. Rama, despite his exile in the forest, obeyed his father's command and achieved success. Whereas Ravana, despite being capable of conquering the whole world, desired for another person's consort and perished. Hence, pay heed to your father's order. Do not desire for another man's wife. Act like Rama, not like Ravana. As it is shown in Poja's comment, 
An Arthavada sentence need not always result in the injunction of a positive action. It can also intend to prevent the reader from performing a particular action. Shabara opines that an Arthavada sentence can produce an attraction to or repulsion from certain things. In short, an Arthavada sentence can either be positive uh, recommending a ritual for a certain purpose or negative prescribing abstinence from a bad result. The Mimamsa scholars opine that there are two sorts of bhavanas or the process of bringing something into existence at work in an Arthavada sentence, namely Shabdi Bhavana and Arthi Bhavana. Shabdi Bhavana is language oriented in the sense that uh, it creates in the listener a desire to perform or stay away from an action. On the other hand, Arthi Bhavana refers to the actual performance of that action by the listener. For example, a person wish to perform a sacrifice which she or he gets after reading a passage about the merits of a sacrifice refers to Shabdi Bhavana, whereas his actual performance of the sacrifice is Arthi Bhavana. Sanskrit literary theoreticians believe that Kavya has the potential to make use of these two sorts of Bhavanas that Arthavada contains. Since uh, Kavi Shastra saw Kavya as a suggestive force, it always made sure that the literature never failed to create aspiration for a morally upright lifestyle. For this, literary theoreticians insisted that Kavya should always show the ultimate victory of the characters who conform to social decorum and the decay of those who defy it. Pocha says that Kavya should never ever show that a law abiding noble character despite conforming to the rules of decorum, fails to emerge victorious over a law-breaking Athama character. If there is an instance which is contrary to this uh, in a story, the poet should make it a point to rewrite the story in such a way that the law-abiding moral character prevails and the wrongdoing Athama character perishes. Poja says, if a person desires to compose a literary work based on a plot from the epic, it is possible that a character who conforms to uh, propriety might not only fail to attain the desired result, but also might receive what he does not desire. On the other hand, another character who has no regard for propriety might attain the result he desires. In such cases, the poet must be revised in such a way that the character who conforms to propriety is not denied the result he desires and the other person should not only fail to attain his desire but also should attain what he does not want. The victory of the characters who live according to the laws of Aujitya and the decay of those who defy them is definitely a way to create aspiration among the readers of Kavya to emulate the propriety bound ways and manners of the noble characters. Hoja, like his predecessors and successors in Kavi Shastra, staunchly believes that the failure of a character who is loyal to the social propriety and the victory of a degenerate character who throws social decorum to the wind will certainly result in the breakdown of Kavya as a soft power or symbolic power or suggestive force. The conception in Sanskrit cosmopolis of a poet as a prophet or seer further strengthened the soft power of Kavya by way of earning the reader's trust in whatever the Kavi spoke. The term Kavi was originally employed to refer to the Vedic hymnists uh, to whom the Vedas were revealed in endless time without beginning or end. The idea of poet as a seer was a prophetic vision in fact begins with the Ramayana where the omniscient narrator says that the whole story of Rama appeared to Valmigi in a prophetic vision during his composition of the Ramayana. Tat Pashyadi Dharmatma Tat Sarvam Yoga Masthidaha Purayat Tatra Nirvurtam Panava Malakam Yatha With the power of yoga the righteous Valmigi so clearly like an amalaga for fruit in the palm of the hand the entire course of events that happened in the past relating to Rama. 
In Kavya Anushasana, Hemajandra equates a poet with a prophet and says that one who is not a seer is not a poet at all. The image of a poet as a seer or prophet in fact cuts across cultures in early Indian societies and it invariably became indispensable in the validation of political power. The king as patron always employed the poet to reel off eulogies or stutis to compose elaborate genealogies uh, to, to position him in a reputed and fabulous dynasty. Romila Thapar observes or points out how the bard or Sukta was often seen as an outsider, normally uh, outside the hierarchy of caste and, and class and he was held in high esteem. Ubinder Singh observes a similar pattern in the early South India, the most important basis of legitimation of political power in early historical South India was eulogy of the poets. Besides this was the high social status of the Kavi or poet. The social position of the poet in ancient India was a very honored one. The poet enjoyed a highly privileged and enviable status in the assemblies and uh, other places of the cultured classes in those days. This in fact shows that the dominant social forces in the society which caused the poet to produce kavya in conformity with the rules of decorum uh, managed to vindicate everything that uh, the Kavi presented by projecting him as a great visionary who could see the past, present and future with his divine vision. To the reader, the Kavi became a demigod who professed truths and values that had to be emulated.